Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. What is up, Anchor? How we doing, guys? How we doing? We doing okay? 10.30? 10.30? 10.30? Hey, we are. We're in this new teaching series called The Prayers That Jesus Prayed, which I'm thankful to be in all through this Lent season, to be looking at Jesus' prayer life, because if we can be honest, is this a safe place? Can we be honest this morning, you guys? Anchor community, can we be honest? I hear one yes, so I'm expecting that to be transferable for all of us, the general sense. Yes, yes. Prayer can be awkward and difficult sometimes. Is that weird to hear a pastor say? Prayer can be awkward and difficult. I remember when I wasn't a Jesus follower, I was invited to a youth group uh, in high school, uh, and I didn't really know what a youth group was, but I said, yes, I went to this youth group. I, I think with the idea that, with classic, that there was going to be girls there, you know, that thing. And so I went, um, and sure enough, there were boys and girls there at this thing. Who would have known? Um, uh, and everything was great. We sang songs that didn't have any cuss words, which was new to me. Uh, and, um, and, and then there was a teaching that was interesting, things I hadn't really heard before. Uh, um, but then we went into small groups to pray. And this were, is where it got awkward for me. Um, because I happened to be sitting next to one of the girls that I happened to think that was attractive there in my sophomore Brian state of life and um and i had never that i remember prayed out loud before and so there the whole purpose of us meeting together in this smaller group was to pray out loud and when it got to me i let out this kind of like you know discombobulated fragmented stutterings and stammerings and i was not speaking in tongues so uh it was not a spiritual gift it was a spiritual non-gift and to the rest of the world uh and on the way home um, still red in the face, uh, my, the friend who invited me was like, dude, what was happening to you? I was literally about to call for some medical support or something like that. Uh, have you had an experience like that? Like where, I mean, you don't even have to be, like Jesus, for some of us that are Jesus followers, like it's somebody came up to me in the lobby, like I don't want, I, I've been following Jesus for 30 years. I still don't like praying out loud. Prayer can be, can we just be honest? It can be like awkward sometimes. It can be difficult sometimes. Prayer can be hard sometimes. Like we're all by ourselves and we've like carved out intentional time to be by ourselves. Some of us like, that sounds amazing. You wake up early and sometimes you have it for 15 minutes. And so you're there. And then even there in that time when you want to pray, you want to be alone, you want to have a quiet time, like, like all these thoughts like intrude, they're unwelcome visitors. And they're like, do this, do that. Oh, you should check your email and blah, blah, blah. And like, it's hard sometimes to pray, isn't it? Prayer is awkward and difficult sometimes. Um, I went through a season of my life while being a pastor after I became a follower of Jesus. That's how the order that goes. <laughs> follower of Jesus and then. Uh, and my prayer life was out of whack. Um, I was doing a lot of praying, but it was in front of people in a public capacity. And my inner prayer, my own prayer life, it was depleted and, and diminished. And so I just felt like, honestly, it was a season of my life as a pastor um, where I just kind of felt like a phony and I didn't know what it looked like to get back in this rhythm. Prayer can be awkward and difficult sometimes. This is why we're looking at Jesus's prayer life. But even, even though prayer can be awkward and difficult sometimes, isn't it interesting that Jesus followers, non-Jesus followers, people that doubt God's existence, people that believe in God's existence, we all end up praying. As the old adage goes, there are no atheists in foxholes, right? Sam Smith, uh, the, the musician, singer, and his song, Pray, says this, or sang this. I'm young and I'm foolish. I've made bad decisions. I block out the news, turn my back on religion. Don't have no degree. I'm somewhat naive. 
I've made it this far on my own. But lately that blank ain't been getting me higher. I lift up my head, the world is on fire. There's dread in my heart and fear in my bones and I just don't know what to say. Maybe I'll pray. Maybe I'll pray. I've never believed in you, no, but I'm gonna pray. This is why we're doing this teaching series because prayer, whether you are a follower of Jesus or not, seems to be our mother tongue. We keep returning to it. We can't get away from it. Even, if it's, even as it is sometimes awkward and difficult in moments of need and moments of quiet and moments in a crowd and moments alone, the prayer bubbles up to our mind silently or comes out of our mouth in actual heard words, prayer. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, if you have a Bible, you can open to it. We'll have it on the screen. He's talking about prayer in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, and when you pray... And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen. You might underline seen there, to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your father who is unseen, and then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard. You might underline heard. Because of their many words, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. You know, I mean, as I mentioned, this is in the Sermon on the Mount, which is like Jesus' greatest hits. You know, some of the most memorable phrases that are integrated into our culture are like from the Sermon on the Mount. And so I've read it multiple times. I've studied it. I've read the commentaries. I've looked at the Greek. I've, I've paid attention to it. But in preparing for this message, two words jumped out that had never jumped out. They're the words seen and heard. Seen and heard. Now, previous to this, I had always just kind of seen, okay, Jesus is kind of sharing, these are the bad guys, the bad guys that don't know how to pray, shame on them, the Pharisees, you know, that kind of pray, you know, kind of like trying to get like a people's applause, and then the pagans who don't know what to, you know, but really what, what's interesting as I was looking at it this week with these words seen and heard, Jesus is acknowledging that the Pharisees and the pagans are both cre- longing for this common human longing, which is to, to be seen and to be heard. It just just got distorted to be seen and to be heard have you experienced this desire yourself this is what a kiddo cries out for when he says mommy or daddy hey look at what I've drawn look at this lego creation look at look at this thing that I've made I want to be seen and heard I want to be paid attention to I want affirmation I want understanding I want someone to acknowledge my existence in a positive way this is what we we do desire, all of us, we can't escape it, to be seen and to be heard. When a wife, uh, in preparation for a date, uh, I guess I'm assuming that there's preparation for a date, puts on that dress that has been in the closet for a long time, walks out of the bedroom and all of a sudden the husband's like, oh, wow, you were, oh, I should have worn more than sweatpants uh, for this day. What's going on there? There's this desire to be like, to be affirmation, right? acclaimed like longing desire this like that's that's happening to be seen and to be heard when a a a boyfriend that usually is a boyfriend you know like a a girlfriend grabs the arm and the boyfriend like flexes the the muscle a little bit like I've never done this personally because I'm already strong so I don't have to (laughs) do that but like you know like what's the desire like what would what would what would do that you know like it's this desire to kind of like to be like thought well of and to hear like wow you're strong look at those muscles you know (laughs) seen and heard like when a friend confides in another friend and that friend doesn't understand they say well that's too bad and walk off why do we feel if you've ever been in a situation like that why do we feel like frustrated or angry or sad why because we're not being seen and heard So here, Jesus says the Pharisees, they go on the street corners because they want to be seen by others. The pagans, 
they, they think they keep talking, thinking that like maybe eventually they'll be heard by God, seen and heard. Typically, and some of us in this room fall into one of these two categories, we're either starved on being seen and heard, like we're desiring it and no one's giving it to us. Sometimes this is why we run into toxic relationships because somebody finally is acknowledging us even if the t- relationship is toxic. Someone's seeing us and hearing us. Or we're drunk on being seen and heard. We're going viral and we only want more. We just want more. We're either drunk on it or we're starved on it. Sometimes we go back and forth because we're just addicted to people loving us. The Pharisees were drunk on being seen. They were in a position of power where people had to pay attention. And so they put their prayers in public so people could appraise them and acclaim them for all to see. Prayer became something that was horizontal, not vertical. And that's why Jesus said they've already got their reward in full because they were not wanting God's reward. They were wanting to be seen so much that it was just this thing and people praised them and then it was completed. That was, the origin, that was what their heart really wanted. They got it already. And the, the pagans, he's saying, they, they keep talking. They think if they're eloquent enough, if they say the right words in the right order, maybe the like divine, maybe God will hear them. To this, God says in verse six, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who knows what is seen, or who sees what is done in secret will reward you. What Jesus is saying is like, don't, don't make, don't use your real common desire, your real common desire to be seen. Don't you know that Jesus already, God already sees you. The father sees you. He, you don't have to distort it and get drunk on it. You don't have to, that desire that we all experience, like you already have it, Rel- relish and recognize that God already sees you so you don't need everyone paying attention to you giving you the acclaim that you're longing for because God already is giving you that you could go into a closet and God would see you perfectly and know what is what your needs are and what you long for Jesus is saying when he says you could go into your room where, where you're unseen and you're by everyone else, he's not saying that we can only pray in a room or in a closet, though if you pray in a closet, God bless you, you're sanctifying your whole house. Um, but, but, but what he's saying is, is like, you know, you could hide from the world and God still sees you. You could not say a word to anyone and God still knows you. This common desire is given freely to you. The answer is given freely. He sees you. And to the pagans, he responds, don't be like them. For your father already knows you, what what, what you need before you ask. Jesus is not saying, hey, you don't have to ever pray because God already knows, so he's going to fix it or whatever. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, like, even before you say a word, even before you are mindful of what you need, God knows you and he sees you so much that he, he already knows. It's like you're coming to him and you're saying, God, and he goes, yeah, I know, I know, I know. This is the answer for the common problem of being starved or drunk on being seen and heard. Recognizing that we start our day being seen and heard by the Father. We don't have to fight for it. We don't have to try hard. It's already freely given to us because of the personal nature of who God is. This is what we call the personal heart of prayer. That prayer is not, it's not saying the right words in the right order to hack the prayer code so you get the answer you want. It's not divine IT. That's this personal heart of prayer. Jesus says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father. Our Father. Now, this, these two words, our father, is incredibly significant. Throughout the Old Testament, never was this vision of relationship with God expressed between an individual and God. Often, or sometimes in the Old Testament, God was referred to as father, but it was the father of Israel. That, that God in a covenant relationship with Israel kind of could be understood as a father. And then other times the prophets would say, God is like a father. 
So there's an analogy, but never before was this like, ability for an individual to, to say, our father, God, my father, this deeply personal expression of prayer. So we take it for granted, but the first century Jews saw it as, as probably their, their jaws were probably on the floor, amazed that Jesus was inviting them into the type of relationship that he had and that they had never experienced. Jesus is inviting not just them though he's inviting us into a type of relationship with God that is personal and intimate and it is not resting on philosophical concept of God that we got in philosophy 101 or that one YouTube video we watched that one time and isn't resting on this idea that God is a cosmic Santa that is to be ditched as if he doesn't give us everything we desire and it is not the vision of God that is this sergeant in the sky that we are to militaristically obey or else, but Father, Father, Father. And because we can pray to God as a Father, it means a couple things. First, it means connection over perfection. Connection over perfection. God is keenly aware that you are not perfect. Sorry. He sees you and he knows you. What he wants is not your, not your efforts to become perfect. You're perfected in Christ because of what Christ has done in the Spirit's work. So in that sense, you're perfect already. What he wants is connection. I love one author who calls his prayer life the longest run-on sentence in the world. Don't you like that? There's never a period. There's never an end of the story. There's just always an ellipsis. It's God, I need you. God, I, oh man, I, God, I need you because today's gonna be a tough day. Oh, hey, how are you doing? No, yeah, yeah, um, no, things are gonna look good. Today's gonna be an easy day. God, would you help me, forgive me because I just lied to them and uh, I, they also annoyed me and I didn't like what was happening in my heart when I was talking to them. God, would you forgive me? Like this run on prayer, right? There's this kind of like, you know, like the idea of a run-on sentence in itself is imperfect because it's like a run-on sentence, right? You know, so, so it's like imperfect grammar from the beginning, but it's connection. This ease of connection to God. Maybe you can take that. Maybe you can like, I'm going to start with the longest run-on sentence of my life with God today. On my way home, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to start that sentence and I'm not going to put an end to the story. I'm just going to put an ellipsis there connection over perfection. One time I was speaking at a youth conference and sometimes these youth conference, they run you ragged. If Anchor ever has one, I hope we don't do this to the speakers, but I'm like doing trainings for the leaders, speaking to the whatever and doing this in the morning, that in the evening. And, and um, uh, I remember I escaped to my little room I had at one point tired and I had to prepare for another thing. And I just kind of fell on my knees and was kind of wanting to pray because I, I, I was like, I need to get spiritually prepared for this next thing that I'm doing. So I wanted to kind of be real before God, but I just didn't have any words. I was just spiritually exhausted, to be honest. And I, I, so I'm just sitting there on my knees, not praying. And I hear from God, Brian, I don't need your words. It was like this realization that was so fresh and invigorating. It's like, God, God doesn't need me. He doesn't need my eloquence. He just needs me to be in proximity to him. And I just need to be in proximity to him. In fact, throughout the history of the church, sometimes prayer is just silently breathing and being mindful that we are in the presence of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. God. Connection over perfection. Intimacy over privacy. We love, and it's appropriate, like we shouldn't say everything on our mind to everything, in everyone in our, in our lane. Like it just, that's inappropriate. You know, that one shouldn't have been said. But with God, like he already knows everything. So why would we try to keep something private from him? What he wants is intimacy. And intimacy is us bringing the things that we have tried to keep private to him and say, here it is. 
Because God is Father, that can be our, the type of prayer we pray. God, this is what I've been shelving away. This is what I've been trying to protect from everyone. This is what I've been nervously afraid to tell you. And I know you already know, but here it is. Let me just tell you, when you pray those types of prayers, there is a new power that will get unleashed in your life. Because what you find is, oh my gosh, I'm still loved. Intimacy over privacy, because God is Father. And then third, power over performance. This will take a little bit of an explanation, but let me just tell you, every relationship where the, where the way, the, the, every relationship that is kind of con, just, just around performance will always be a strained relationship. Because if, if the relationship is dependent upon us, perf, one of us performing, then, then I'm always going to be nervous around you, right? Because I'm always going to be like, am I doing good or bad? Or I don't know. That's not the relationship we have with God the Father. It's one where he gives us his power to walk in freedom. What do I mean by that? Galatians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, Paul is describing a lot of, I mean, really what, what Jesus is inviting us into, like to be able to call God Father. He says, because you are his sons, because you're his kids, God sent the spirit of his son into, your, into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father, so that you are no longer a slave to people's vision of how you're performing. You're not a slave as you live out into the world. No, you're not a slave, but you are God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. So we get to walk in this power that we are God's kids and we are not, we are not, it's our, our value is not dependent upon our performance in the world. We are preformed in love by him. We are his kids. He, we are his heir. So we get to walk in this power. If you are a kid, if a child knows this as an analogy, if a child knows that they are on a subconscious level loved by their mother and father, and they go into the school and they, they hear, you didn't do as well as I wanted you to do on the test. I don't like how you dress. You're, you're not as good at soccer as this person. They can continue to operate in freedom if they know on a subconscious level that they are so loved by mom and dad. Yes, there might be heartache. There might be things to work through. But like, this is just what psychologists have, have seen this. And the same true is true with God the Father. If we know that we are loved by the Father, we can walk into the world and experience everything that the world will throw at us and we can still, at the end of the day, know that we are not the sum total of our successes or failures, but the sole object of God's love, or not the sole object, because we're all objects of God's love, but we are objects of God's love and that, that, that can't be taken away. And so we get to walk in this power. Recently, I was talking with someone and, and I, I found myself like wanting their acclaim. I wanted something from them. Maybe you've been in a situation like that. And I kind of was mindful of it. I'm like, oh, I'm playing according to the script of the world. I'm playing according to a performance mindset. I was mentally aware of this. And I, I was like, no, I don't have to play according to a performance mindset because I've got a power from, the, from, from God that I can walk in because I'm his kid. I don't have to do this. And there's this little shift that played into it. And all of a sudden I saw the relationship differently. And for the first time, I was actually able to bless the other person rather than try to get this person's acclaim. This is a verse or this is a song that I have on my mind in moments like this that I want to give to you. It may be as something that you can memorize and I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to not sing it because I, I, I don't want to bless you too much. Um, <laughs> But it, it goes like this. Maybe you've heard it. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. It opens prison doors and sets the captives free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. That song was on my mind in that relationship that I just described. And I'm like, oh, I, instead of trying to get this person's acclaim, I've already have the acclaim of the Father. So I get a pass on blessing and I get to be the source of, of, of blind eyes opening and prison doors 
doors open again so I don't have to play according to the performance mindset. God has brought a whole different power into my life that I play according to that and according to knowing that I've already got his applause because of what Christ has done. So I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. There's nothing else that can do that. We get to call God Father. Man, how powerful would it be if we all lived that way? He says, pray in this way. Our Father in heaven, holy be your name. Holy be your name. So it's, it's, not, just, it's not just that he's Father, but he is holy. That means he's not subject to the folly of earthly fathers. Many of us, many of the work we have to do with a spiritual director, with a counselor, a therapist, a pastor, a mentor, is untangling the knot of our own experience with our earthly father so that we can appreciate that God is father. The freedom that he offers. Many of us, that's our journey. Many of us are still, the knot still tangled. And so we're not walking in the freedom that actually God is inviting us to. And so a lot of our spiritual formation is just untangling that knot so we can walk in freedom. God is not a faulty father. He is a holy father. And it also means because he is holy that he has no equal and he is worthy of unequal honor. He is no equal and he is worthy of unequal honor. Sometimes like this shapes our prayers, right? So our prayer, a prayer can be a run-on sentence with just ellipses, but sometimes like we recognize the holiness of God, so we come with words prepared. Some of us, like we, we haven't been in a church where we have like a prayer that goes call and response, you know, before, but that's a little bit of what we do. We come at the end of our gatherings here and we have this call and response prayer because we're like, here are words we've come that reflect the holiness of God that we've crafted in a way that brings honor to God and with intentionality that we all get to say together as we're sent out from here. Gerard Manley Hopkins, the poet, he says, oh God, you are lightning and love. And I love this as a description of God, the Holy Father. He is lightning, he is powerful, he is like none other, and he is love, he is tender, he is near. If we resolve that tension, we miss out on God. He is lightning and he is love. But it's not just that there's this personal nature of prayer. There's also what we're calling the heart posture of prayer. The heart posture of prayer. You may kneel when you pray. You may like do some type of stretch thing when you pray. But what's most important is your heart posture. Jesus says, as he continues this prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the ancient world, a kingdom was a place where the values and way of life that the king desired was put into practice. As you can imagine, this could be good or bad, depending on the king, right? A bad king could institute laws that uh, sabotage human flourishing, trampled on the poor and the vulnerable, but a good king could allow the freedom, uh, for freedom while also creating ways for the vulnerable to be cared for. Jesus is the ultimate good king. His kingdom is a kingdom that brings human flourishing and honor to God. So when we pray, we don't pray for our kingdoms. We relinquish our grasp on our kingdoms. We pray for his kingdom. His kingdom is the only kingdom that can bring the level of freedom that people really need. When you look at Jesus' life, you see this. Who, like, Jesus healed lepers. He, he, healed, he exercised demons. Why did he do that? Did he do that just to show how powerful he is? Yeah, no. He did that because that's what his kingdom's like. His kingdom is like a leper being healed. His kingdom is like a, a person being exercised from demonic oppression. His kingdom is like a person who, who can't see being, their eyes being open. That's what his kingdom's like. That's what his kingdom's like. So, so when we pray for his kingdom come, that's what we're praying for. It's a, when we pray for our kingdom to come, we're just heaping our desires on top of our desires. But when we pray for his kingdom to come, we're praying for the world to experience the saving, healing power of the risen king. And that's what we really want to see in this world. I love this quote by Jürgen Moltmann, a theologian. He says, Jesus' healings are not supernatural miracles in a natural world. They are the only truly natural thing in a world that is unnatural, demonized, and wounded. 
What he's saying there, he's saying is that originally when God created the world, he didn't want to see all the injustice, all the sin, racism, pain, all that kind of stuff. So his plan is to bring his kingdom that, that overturns the effects of sin. That's his kingdom. The oldest prayer in, in the Christian church is Maranatha, which just means come Lord, come in your kingdom. We pray this on a global and massive level. God, would you come in the crisis, the war in Ukraine? Would you bring justice to the perpetrators, healing to the vulnerable? God, we don't know what, how to figure out how to do that. It doesn't seem like the enough is being mobilized quickly enough to bring what's needed. God, would your kingdom come? This doesn't excuse us from action, but sometimes propels us into action with the climate crisis and all the questions there. Would your kingdom come? It doesn't excuse us from action, but propels us to action. God, would your kingdom come to all the polarization in this nation would your kingdom come we don't another need another earthly kingdom we don't need brian's kingdom we need jesus's kingdom that's what we need would your kingdom come we pray it on a personal level to families that are suffering that don't have enough money to pay their mortgage or the light bill would your kingdom come in that home god would your kingdom come in those tense relationships would your kingdom come to marriages that are in crisis where they start talking about divorce no would your kingdom come not divorce would your kingdom come would healing come in those relationships would healing come in those homes to those battling mental and emotional health, wondering if there is a way forward, would your kingdom come in that place? Would your kingdom come, spirit of the living God? We need your kingdom. We don't need my kingdom. The world doesn't need your kingdom. It needs Jesus' kingdom. It doesn't need the Democrats' kingdom. It doesn't need the Republicans' kingdom. It needs the kingdom of Jesus. That's what it needs. This is something we're praying for here at Anchor. In fact, we started doing healing and prayer nights and uh, where we just say, invite people, come. Come to experience healing. Come to experience the kingdom. Uh, physically, you need healing, we'll pray for you. Spiritually, you feel kind of like under attack, we'll pray for you. We believe God heals. We believe it's kingdom. He wants to bring his kingdom. People emotionally suffering will, will pray for you. And we, we, it was cool to hear stories of God's kingdom coming as we, as we prayed for people. And, he, and I got an email I just want to read to you. It's like a picture. This is a picture of his kingdom to come. So the healing prayer night was really powerful for me. This is from this person. The healing prayer night was really powerful for me. I still have a long road ahead towards healing after how traumatic the last year and a half has been. But I finally feel like the fog I've been living under is lifting. Thank you, Jesus. Because of that, and over the last several weeks, I have been making steps forward towards greater wholeness, but also towards the things God has spoken to me about. Do you see that? You're freed. God kingdoms, God's kingdom comes to a person's life and they're mobilized towards mission. They're mobilized towards calling. They're freed from, from shame. They're freed from it. This is why we want his kingdom. The band can come up at this time. I, I'm... You know, Jesus is not like, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes uh, I'm, I'm writing a postcard and like I forget like that I'm writing a postcard and I just start writing words. Ever done that? I'm like, oh, that sentence doesn't actually make sense. I've got to start a new postcard. Like when Jesus says, our father who, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When he says on earth as it is in heaven, he's not looking for filler words, okay? He's not saying like, I uh, don't know what I should put here. What has the right amount of kind of syllables? He is giving us license to pray for the power of heaven to take root and, and fill all of earth. This is Jesus's prayer. Would you join him in that? We get to step into this. So I want to give an invitation to some of us in the room. Some of us in the room need to just get prayer. And here's the thing. If we play according to the world script, then, then we would hear, oh, it would be embarrassing. Maybe I won't. But if we play according to the kingdom script, it's like, no, come run to the father. 
Don't let anything keep you from prayer. So there's prayer on both sides. Um, uh, and we want you to run to the Father and not listen to the world script that says, I don't know, I don't know. No, run to the Father if you need prayer. There's people in this room that need prayer. There's communion, and, and communion is a picture of, of the level of God's love expressed in the person of Jesus who was born in a manger, but then died on a cross and rose from a tomb. And, but in, in the night before he died, he took bread and he says, this is my, this is like my body. It's, it's given for you. Do you see what I'm doing? This is the new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. He took the cup, says, this is my blood. It's given for you. Drink this in the, for, for the forgiveness. Like this, as long as you get together, remember that I love you. So we get to do that. We get to remember that he loves us and that we're forgiven by what he's done. And we have access to a good father because of his work in sending the spirit and dying on the cross. We get that privilege. So come. In this next song, we get to sing get to take communion. We get the opportunities for prayer. And let me just tell you, if you are not yet a follower of Jesus, if you're like, if if you're new to this thing, the invitation is extended to you. Why would you say no to the riches of the King who is extending it it to you? He is giving, he sees you and he knows you and he's extending his love to you. Would you say yes to his work on the cross, paying for your sins? Would you say yes? Spirit of the living God, come in this place. Open our hearts to you, to the calloused, we pray that you would soften our hearts. Your kingdom come, your will be done. We're tired of our kingdoms. We want yours, Jesus. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, amen.